All right, Katie. Last year, mm -hmm. I'm in an Uber on the way home from work. As one does. As one does. The Uber driver has got his crypto account open. While he's driving. While he's driving. Okay. And he's showing me all the money that he's made on crypto over the last few months. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking Bitcoin or Ether here. I'm talking coins. You can say that. I just did. Okay. And he's like, okay, when it starts, it's so easy. When it starts going up, you buy. And then when it gets really high, you sell. I've heard that before. Well, that's what he was doing. Yeah. And all I could think of to myself was, this is the top. You know, when your Uber driver's showing you how much money he's made in crypto and mm -hmm. how you got to get in on it. And I'm thinking, this is not going to end well for this guy. And sure enough, here we are, a few months later, $2 trillion in crypto value has been wiped out. And I'm not hearing Uber drivers talk about their crypto anymore. Well, if that story's true, and it sounds super fake, I, let's just true. establish that. I promise it happened. Okay, well, if it's true, it actually was pretty close to the top. If you think about where we were around November of last year, close to a record high on Bitcoin. And to your point, we've just seen this tremendous drawdown of wealth since then. And I actually think that creates one of the more interesting moments in crypto. After the summer we just lived through where it felt like everything blow up, now's the moment where the industry sort of has to decide where to go from here. Whether this is a 2018 moment after that boom and bust, which went on to build an even bigger bubble or whether we're entering a phase of the crypto ecosystem where it's more mature. Mm. So luckily for us, we have eight episodes to try to do that. I have all these papers in front of me and uh, we're gonna try to figure out what moment we're actually in right now. And funnily enough, we actually prepared something. No to... kidding. Yeah, we did. <laughs> It only took a few months, but more than $2 trillion in crypto wealth was wiped out. We're talking wreckage that was far and wide here. Yeah, we got the billionaires on one side, but we got everyday people who lost their life savings. We saw currencies collapse. There were mass layoffs at companies, and some of these companies were once valued at billions of dollars, declared bankruptcy. So what happened? Well, there was the collapse of this so-called algorithmic stablecoin. And what that did is it set off this chain reaction that brought one of the best known crypto hedge funds to its knees. We gotta go back to May to understand what really happened here. The collapse of Terra USD. This is an algorithmic stablecoin and it once topped the charts. Now, it, it's not exactly clear what set off the slump in demand for UST, but then we saw this death spiral and it knocked UST off its $1 peg. Think about this as like the crypto equivalent of a bank run. At the same time, crypto had been falling in price since the end of last year. But then as Terra was melting down, the panic started to spread and it dropped the price of Bitcoin by nearly 30% in just a week. The problem is that lenders were using Bitcoin for collateral and that just led to carnage across the industry. Take Three Arrows Capital. It was this previously invincible hedge fund. It once managed as much as $10 billion and it declared bankruptcy. This was just a mess, but it's a mess that we've got to make sense of and we've got to understand. A $60 billion collapse of an ecosystem that led to a massive decline in the price of Bitcoin and then the outright collapse of companies. It was contagion, but it was contagion that raises really important questions. What's the collateral damage to an industry after an event like this? And perhaps most importantly, have people just lost faith in crypto? All right. We have a lot of questions. We've got Stacey Marie Ishmael. She leads crypto coverage for Bloomberg, arguably the busiest woman at Bloomberg. It's been a, a moment. It's, it's been, been a moment. <laughs> and I guess when I think back to the summer of 2021, that run up to last November, where we reached the record high in Bitcoin, one of the big bullish mantras was institutional mm -hmm. adoption, sort of traditional Wall Street embracing crypto. And when you say that we're kind of learning the lessons of 2008, what is the reputational damage here? Is that no longer really a narrative that holds? It's been interesting to see institutions plunge in, not just like a toe in the water, at the same time that retail investors are a little bit more skittish and a little bit more inclined to sit on the sidelines. So, you know, just in the past six months, you've had BlackRock announce a partnership with Coinbase. You've had Goldman Sachs make certain types of derivatives available to clients. Even more recently, you know, you have kind of Citadel, Fidelity and others saying they're going to back something like a crypto-esque um, exchange program. 
So I do think that one of the interesting features of this institutional adoption is they're like, we're already regulated, mm -hmm. we know how to do this, we have all of the available licenses, we understand how to man manage risk, and they're seeing opportunities. Is there concern that right now the everyday person, the normal retail person, is just completely scared away and is going to potentially miss an opportunity because they got worried about what happened, you know, post Matt Damon. <laughs> and they're just saying, I'm not gonna touch this stuff anymore. There's a few different ways that we're thinking about that. On the one hand, you know, if you were a to the moon yield farming, I'm looking at 19 Please different rise. protocols, you know, you're like, yeah, down with decentralization. On the other hand, if you're somebody who watched perhaps your friends, perhaps your family, perhaps yourself lose your life savings in something like Voyager or Celsius, then maybe you're gonna look at a Citadel or a Fidelity or a BlackRock and be like, they seem like they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Their presence might be reassuring to you. So you've got sort of competing dynamics in the market at the same time. Sort of the adults in the room. That's what they would like you to say. Yeah, and here I am <laughs> saying it, so there you go. I am curious though, I mean, it feels like a lot of the chaos, the contagion was centered around these crypto lenders and I'd love if you could bring out your crystal ball and gaze into it and tell us are we ever going to go back to the days of like 18 percent returns or lending returns or is that over? If I could answer this question accurately I would be in a very different job. Yeah. However, <laughs> uh, I will say that as a person who covered the financial crisis for a while they were like we'll never go back to XYZ and then like three years later somebody was like I've got this really exotic product I want to sell you and the memories and the timelines that we tend to operate on in crypto are even shorter, right? Where sort of in the dying embers of um, Luna and the, the associated stablecoin, you had other folks being like, this is why our algorithmic stablecoin is gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think there is an, an kind of an, an inertia built into the system of anything that we invent can only be positive unless there's widespread evidence to the contrary and then we'll just do v2 okay so for the past few years people in the space have been telling me when i don't understand something it's like it's the early days of the internet right. this is like the 1990s when you know andreessen had just invented netscape and you know we're trying to figure out what you can do with this thing if if that's accurate mm -hmm. did what we see in the early part of 2022, the explosion, was that the dot-com bust? One of the things about the dot-com bust is there were clear winners that emerged from it, but you couldn't really tell who those winners would be mm. at the time. And so I do think that some of the immediate speculative excess got wrung out of the market very hard and very fast and very painfully for a lot of people involved. But, you know, it took years for Amazon to become Amazon, and it took a while for people to be like, ah, pets.com is pets.com. <laughs> and we are still in, you know, sort of the immediate aftermath of that, where it's like, you don't know who the Amazon is gonna be and who the pets.com is. Right, I mean, Amazon's actually only been a profitable company reliably for like not that many years. Exactly. So there was this really grim time a few months ago when things were crashing. Message boards were filled with people, you know, anecdotes of people who lost everything. Our colleagues here at, at Bloomberg published a story about people who lost everything with Voyager. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were, there were people who were talking about self-harm in, in these forums. And I'm just wondering what we've heard from the industry over that period of time. I wouldn't say there's been a ton of self-flagellation or even kind of explicit, whoops, are bad. It's much more around well, one, a lot of people are getting sued, mm. and when you're being sued actively by thousands of people, it is perhaps against the advice of counsel to be like, well, we made mistakes, <laughs> because that would be appearing to admit guilt of some kind. Makes sense. But I also think there's a, there's a nihilistic streak in crypto that suggests that, well, you should have known what you were getting into. Like, you know, how come you... You invested more money than you could afford, that's on you. If you were margined and leveraged up to your eyeballs, that's on you. We didn't tell you to put your life savings in crypto. And I do think that's a problem for the industry because it's the kind of rhetoric that regulators do not seem best pleased by because it reminds them of things like 
um, the earlier days of sports betting and gambling before mm -hmm. those were recognized as you know having potentially addictive properties and the, the messaging around that really had to change. So I do think there has been an insufficient amount of contrition relative to the amount of boosting mm. that there was by a lot of these folks. What's happened instead is people are just like deleting tweets, taking down YouTube videos, being like the ha just kidding, JK. And I don't think that that is necessarily endearing themselves to the people who did lose everything. But again, there's always a new, there's always a new buyer, right? There's always somebody who's coming in for the first time and I worry about that new buyer. Mm -hmm. With us now, Meltem Demirs, extremely cool woman, also the chief strategy officer of CoinShares. Meltem, when we think about the past few months, really even the past few years if we extend it out, people, uh, cranks, have been warning that this would end in tears. Basically this big run up we saw across the ecosystem. But when you think about what actually happened, the way that the cards fell, how obvious was it? Did it happen in the way that maybe had been expected? Yes and no. I think there were always, as early as 2018, 2019, when the derivative side of Bitcoin markets and crypto markets more broadly really started to take off and institutional lending started to emerge, one of the common narratives in the media was, oh, leverage is going to be the undoing of crypto. And as we've talked about before, in crypto markets, leverage functions very differently than in traditional markets. In traditional markets, you can use existing securities. And what we actually ended up seeing, there were all of these rumors, all of the speculation in traditional media around decentralized finance or on-chain financial products being the undoing of crypto. And very ironically, or in sort of an interesting twist, it ended up being the application of traditional lending models, mm -hmm. i.e. uncollateralized or under-collateralized lending, that caused this massive wave of washouts. Were, were you guys exposed to that at all? Uh, you know, coin shares or uh, in venture investments that you've done? Yeah, so we had minimal exposure. We had a small amount of exposure to Terra, which was the Luna stable coin, which were publicly listed. So it was in our Q2 financials, had very little impact on our business. So knock on wood and congrats to our risk management team for, for doing a good job there. And then the big part of the ecosystem I'm still concerned about is crypto miners. Mm. W wait, w why? So in the mining business model, mining is an interesting sort of area, and I come from the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. So we're accustomed in the oil and gas industry. Like real mining, like real digging. Real mining, yeah. real digging. No, we're not talking computers Trumps here. That we're are talking as big as a two-story house. Yeah. Drills, correct. Yeah, if you've never seen a Christmas tree, which is the thing that goes on top of a, a wellhead, highly recommend. But um, <laughs> you know what? Tell you, me. My TikTok and Instagram are like all like people doing oil drilling. What does that really? say? I don't know. Like, how, do, how did the algorithm it's, get there? It's like, I like mechanical things. So it's like- Tim likes planes. Yeah, like it's like airplanes and like oil rigs and stuff. So I feel like I've learned a little bit. Real mining. Yeah. So the challenge with real mining is, is um, it's very capital intensive because you have to buy a6, these specialized semiconductors used for mining, or GPUs in the case of Ethereum, or FPGAs in the case of zero knowledge proofs. Like you buy physical stuff, um, and that physical stuff's expensive. And when you raise capital, and in particular venture capital, people don't necessarily want to give you money to buy a bunch of depreciating hardware. So you finance it. There's mm. a lot of specialized lenders in the industry who specialize in lending. Um, using the actual chips themselves as the collateral. So if I want to borrow, say, $500 million to build a new data center to mine a cryptocurrency, I may pledge those machines as collateral to secure the loan. So there's this interesting capital recursivity that starts to happen. And what also happens is you have operating expenses. Your operating expense is the cost of energy. And no matter what type of compute you do, all computing requires energy, mm. right? Energy in a semiconductor. And so the challenge is energy prices are rising. A lot of the contracts that facilities have in place, these power purchasing agreement or PPAs, 
were not well negotiated because a lot of people in the crypto mining space aren't necessarily from the traditional infrastructure space. And so energy prices rising, semiconductor prices dropping, so the value of your collateral that secured your loan is going down. They don't have collateral to top up the loan. So they end up having to sell Bitcoin at greatly reduced prices. And right. their price to mine a Bitcoin then starts to exceed the profit they make. Yep. So it creates this really interesting sustainable finance challenge where the fundamental economics of the business stop working. But in a sense, that's actually similar to what happens with real oil and gas. Absolutely. So if the price of oil falls below We a saw certain, this in natural gas, right? right? Shale gas, right? If it, if it gets too low, then it's not worth it to actually extract it. Exactly. So, you know, shale gas, probably five or six dollars per million cubic cubic feet to get out of the ground and gas prices for a long time were two to three dollars so those economics don't work so what's that number for bitcoin for bitcoin right now the cost to mine a bitcoin it really varies right so the operational efficiencies really depend on how you set up your infrastructure what your power costs are what your interest rates are on your machines what your cost of equity is on other capital you raise people always tell me to zoom out though like when it comes to the inflation hedge argument yeah. can we put it to bed though can we agree that it's not an inflation no because i also i'm gonna go with the the zoom out I think the challenge is um, Bitcoin has never existed in an inflationary environment until roughly nine months ago. Mm -hmm. So I do think we need to give it a bit more time. I've never existed in an inflationary environment. Same. Yeah. Although, if we look back at the data, if we zoom out enough. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to get to the year that she was born. <laughs> there was still no inflation, right? Yeah. No inflation. Okay, so but there yeah. has been inflation in, in certain areas and deflation in other areas. Yeah. Right? thanks to technology innovation, right? Like, yeah. amazing thing. So I think those three factors taken together just create a lot of uncertainty. And then I do think the one thing that we don't talk about enough, um, and again, at CoinShare, we have an amazing research team, people always try to find factors, right? And, and understand, okay, what factors are going to influence price direction on this asset class? So much of it is narrative driven. Mm. So much of it is narrative driven. So much of it is psychology driven. And I do think there is an element of religious belief that underpins a lot of this as well. Well, I want to get to that religious belief because we saw a lot of excitement in the last year when we saw record highs, for not just for, for Bitcoin and for Ether, but for you everything. Know, coins. Number right? go up, baby. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm wondering if, if the industry if you think the industry needs to apologize for anything. Uh, okay, so this is a really interesting question. And this again is where I think um, the consumer protection debate comes in. So on the one hand, the reason that we have a lot of the securities laws, the capital markets laws we do in the United States is a regulator or an external body doesn't necessarily have the authority to say, this is good, this is bad. What they have the authority to say is, here are the rules, here's the information we need, this is what needs to be provided. Right? Being publicly listed is not a barometer of quality, it's a barometer of you having filled out the appropriate work, paperwork and having provided financials and a level of transparency that will allow investors to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is about people making informed decisions. I think the challenge with crypto is so many people in 2021 especially, we saw this in 2018 and before that in 2014, yeah. so many people view crypto and so many people online marketed crypto as a way to get rich quick. So people were marketing a lot of these things as an easy button and as you and I and everyone knows, right, there is no easy button. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is that a lot of people had incentives to market certain things as safe, to encourage people to invest in certain things. And also people don't want to do their diligence. The point I'm making and what I'm trying to illustrate is this is not a phenomenon that's unique to crypto. It exists in all parts of the market. Can I just say, to maybe defend the crypto industry a little bit more, think about the traditional currency industry. Forex scammers on Instagram, I just can't, I want before basically crypto exploded in the way it did in the pandemic. So my favorite accounts on Instagram were these like forex scammers, like <laughs> flexing like their Gucci's and yes. their Ferraris. But on the well, but jet yes, with, like, the, I yeah. love. But I think you make a good point though. Yeah, but you're not yes. seeing those advertised in the Super Bowl. No, no, you know? but. So it, 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 it did. It did reach a different level. But some of, are you saying of the cultural zeitgeist? Well, I mean, a forex scammer is different from like Coinbase buying. A Super Bowl ad. Right. Which, by the way, but I love not... that Super Bowl ad. 
Was that the QR code? It was just the QR code bouncing, bouncing QR around. Code. I'm like, yeah. it's kind of a baller move to spend yeah. millions of dollars on a little so bouncy I, QR code. So it sounds like the, the, I mean, in your opinion, the industry does not have anything to apologize for. It's more like... I think apologize is a challenging word. I think there are certain individuals who maybe behaved in a way that is not great, but I'm not a judge. I'm not a jury. I'm not an executioner. I do my best to not engage in that behavior. I never tell people, invest in this, buy this, do mm -hmm. this. Um, so I can't speak for that. I'm not the moral compass of the industry. Again, another challenge, like it's decentralized, it's leaderless by its very nature. I think it's very difficult for any one individual or entity to sort of claim moral superiority, including the US government, by the way, for this very <laughs> precise reason you just started. To yeah, it. yeah. It's a slippery slope. I understand what you're trying to arrive at. Um, I do think that certain executives of certain companies that lost millions, tens of millions, billions of dollars of consumers' funds, um, they definitely have explaining to do, and I do think they'll be held to account because mm. a company exists under a legal structure in a jurisdiction with protocols. But you have a really cool story where you recognize something early on when it came to Bitcoin. What did you see? When did you see it? And I mean, yeah, I mean, and how much Bitcoin did you buy then? <laughs> so on the last question, are you a nice whale? try, IRS. <laughs> 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 no, I'm okay, you're not going to tell us how much Bitcoin you bought. No, I'm never going to tell you that. Okay, but what was the price of Bitcoin when you first got in? Uh, when I got in, it was around $150. And then I went through a period where when I first started working, I was making less than I had before grad school, and I was in a lot of debt because I'd had a scholarship for my company to go to grad school, and then I didn't come back. So I lived in a rat-infested apartment in New Ooh. York, and I used every paycheck to buy more Bitcoin. Wow. And then the price of Bitcoin went from $300 to $120, and I did not feel great about my life choices. But it was really funny because people look at it now, and they're like, oh, did you have some intuition? And I'm like, no, I just thought it was really interesting, the people I was interacting with. Like, I'd never interacted with people like that before professionally, and I was like, this is wild, it's fun, it's really crazy and insane. See, I would have said, yes, I did have intuition, and I can see the future. Yeah, I'll be very honest. <laughs> and you're not a part of it. And it was fun. You know what I miss? There is a certain joy in believing something that no one else believes in, and willing to grind to like prove that you were right. Are those Very days fun. over though? No. Well, Where let's... you could make those kind of outsized returns on a coin, a crypto. Um, I don't think it's a coin anymore. I think where the world is shifting to, I, I do think um, what is gonna generate outsized returns is capturing and creating, by the way, trends. So I do think identifying emerging cultural movements or communities early and investing in the financialization of those cultural movements is going to be a huge thematic trend. And so that is really interesting. It's one that a lot of people aren't talking about, aren't looking at. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's still opportunities. They're just not going to be as easy because there's a lot more capital. There's a lot more people. So you have to be willing to go where other people won't go. And lucky for me, I like really weird people. I like really <laughs> weird things, and I'm willing to bet enormous amounts of money on really crazy ideas. But I think that's where the returns will continue to be. Meltem Demirs, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Just influencing. <laughs> <laughs> that one okay? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, we should do it again. I'm down. All right. Cool. Let's All right. do it. See ya. Thank you.